are out from Ireland for the Irish. But who are the Irish? Not the rack-renting, slum-owning landlord. Not the sweating, profit-grinding capitalist. Not the sleek and oily lawyer. Not the prostitute pressman, the hired liars of the enemy. Not these are the Irish upon whom the future depends. Not these, but the Irish working class, the only secure foundation upon which a free nation can be reared. The cause of labor is the cause of Ireland, and the cause of Ireland is the cause of labor. It's physical and moral courage. Uh, those are the qualities of a truly great man. I'm proud that he was an Edinburgh man. James Conley travelled the world, didn't just join political organisations, but actually started political organisations, was involved in founding the trade union movement here in Edinburgh and the socialist movement here in Edinburgh. The importance of education, of the democratic intellect, as it's been called here, obviously went straight into its bones. Connolly was a Marxist, whatever particular kind of Marxist he may have been, he was a Marxist revolutionary. Uh, to have a, a proper uh, developed society where everyone would be treated equal and with equal opportunities is a socialist society. I, I say that would be his position quite clearly. Conway was one of the great intellectuals, one of the great Irish intellectuals. Pierce, who was making fine speeches, was once interrupted by Connolly, who said, you know, is there going to be anything more than speeches? Uh, is there going to be a rising now? The place for Ireland's battle is here. Stanley was born in uh, June uh, 1868 and he was the third son of uh, John Connolly and Mary McGinn. They were a young couple who uh, left County Monaghan in those awful years after the Great Famine. Those that were desperately poor headed for Liverpool and for Glasgow and in huge numbers. And after a period of time there was so much alarm at these poor beggars coming from Ireland that they decided to send a number of them back. And it's generally recognised now that the history of the Irish in Scotland is the history of the poorest. It's the history of the workers, the people who came here, they built the canals, built the railways, and they lived in absolutely the worst conditions in our cities, including Little Island here in the Cowgate. So some of the poorest Irish who wanted to get out knew that if they were to set sail for Liverpool or for Glasgow, they were likely to be returned home. So they started to come in to the lowlands of Scotland, and in particular into Edinburgh. And they moved into that area that the kind of rich middle class people had vacated. At the beginning of the 19th century, there would have been less than 1,000 Catholics in Edinburgh, mostly uh, Catholic Highlanders who were here in a few maybe wealthy families. But by the time we got into the second half of the 19th century, in Little Island alone, in the area of the Cowgate and Grass Market where Connolly was born, there was over 25,000 Irish Catholics. The Catholic Church, which in Scotland is, for the most part, composed of Irish immigrants, much more so than in England. The only part of Scotland that remained Catholic after the Reformation was part of the Highlands. So the lowlands of Scotland was completely Protestant and Catholicism was, was reborn in the lowlands through Irish immigration. They were coming into uh, the city of John Knox. Uh, they certainly would have uh, been confronted with uh, a considerable discrimination and it would have shown itself in all sorts of uh, different ways. So it was a hostile environment uh, in which they came into. The Connollys wouldn't have gone immediately to Edinburgh, but would have sought employment uh, going through Glasgow and eventually moving uh, further west and, and settling in Edinburgh. Um, employment was very, very difficult to gain, and uh, 
but eventually they did settle there and uh, the father uh, found some work as a carter with the Edinburgh Cleansing Department. His job was to take horse dung from the street, put it on a cart, drive up with it. His whole life, so to speak, was filled with horse dung. And as the young Connolly stood there in the Cowgate, he could lock up, look up and see the great streets of George IV Bridge and South Bridge on either side of that dark Cowgate where he had grown up and the wealthy people going to and fro on top there. The boy learnt Marxism before he could read. <laughs> I mean, there was industry in Edinburgh. Um, there was a working class Edinburgh alongside a uh, cultured middle class bourgeois Edinburgh, if you want to put it in those terms. Uh, breweries, printing, that kind of work, furniture making. Um, Connolly's father, I think, wouldn't have been in the running for that kind of work, although we do know that he was a literate man. He could read and write. Connolly often said that himself. So maybe he got some basic schooling, national schooling, who knows? That's a grey area that we don't know about. But not enough to qualify him for more than what he did, which was mostly working as a carter down in the old town. But the reality was that he did live in one of the poorest areas of Edinburgh. The Cowgate Little Island area was, was in very worse conditions. And it, exactly as historians have pointed out, rich people living in George IV Bridge would regularly throw their rubbish and sewage down over the bridge into Little Island where the Irish lived. There was no sanitary conditions. They were absolutely appalling for people to live in. So Connolly lived in that. That immediately gave him an understanding of the class structure of the existing society at that time. And I think people like James Connolly and their family would have been radicalised by that. That resulted in a young man like him becoming self-educated to try and change the conditions of the, of the community that he came from. He would have encountered poverty and he would have encountered injustice. Uh, he, would have, he would have encountered humiliation. A very snobbish city, this. Uh, so, undoubtedly, that, that, that's the kind of thing that makes people class conscious, but needs something else to make them conscious of socialism as the answer to the class problem. Connolly must have heard a certain amount of the raw material of Irish history from his parents and the stories they told. The idea of learning how to be a socialist and being developed a nationalist consciousness would have been something forced on Connolly by his environment. People become socialists because socialism is the answer to the problems they encounter, either as a working class person or as someone who sympathises with a working class. And I know this area that round, around the Cowgate, the High Street, this, I know it very well. Uh, I, I used to work here 50 years ago when it was one of the worst slums in Edinburgh. So, and that, it was, it was even worse than Connolly's day. So Connolly grew up politically within a, a culture that was politically a vigorous one in Edinburgh and certainly the national question, broadly interpreted to include Ireland, wouldn't have been left out of the kind of debates that Connolly took part in. Just as he approached the age of 14, Connolly had to do what so many of his class had to do, had to forge his birth certificate and join the British Army. An important and underwritten episode in his life. Now, conditions in the British regular army had improved a lot. Uh, basically under a package often known as the Cardwell Reforms of 1870. He, he joined the uh, King's Liverpool Regiment in 1882 and when he was posted to Ireland they say uh, that uh, he, he served some duty in Castle Bar, in Yall, uh, at the Curra. I think by the time he gets to Cork the Land League memory is inescapable and I think too you can see it in James's later writings that the issue of land and land ownership was crucial to lots that he wrote. The whole question of land nationalisation, for example, was something that was um, preached by Irish socialists in the First International uh, in the 1860s and 1870s. And he eventually was quartered at Beggar's Bush Barracks in Dublin and on one Sunday afternoon when he had some uh, a day leave he wanted to visit Kingstown, uh, now Dunleary, and he went to wait for the tram and also waiting for the same tram 
was this young Protestant serving girl, Lily Reynolds. I have had intentions of, when recruited a little, endeavouring to settle down and trying to realise that ideal of home which I have formed in my mind. With your help, Lily, I'd hoped to find happiness. In other words, I'd intended to ask you if you could find the courage to risk your life and welfare, along with such a scapegrace as myself. Some of the correspondence leading up to the marriage is quite interesting because uh, Lily would have to agree that any children from the marriage would be raised as Catholics. And Connolly, in his correspondence to Lily, is quite embarrassed and almost apologetic for the demands that this would require. You know, he taught himself languages just in order to read. He was said to be devoted to Shakespeare but was too poor at any time of his life ever to actually afford to see Shakespeare performed. But that speaks of a, a lust for reading. And, and you only have to read his works to realise that a man with next to no formal education could read and write and could refer to books that he'd obviously read inside out. I mean, the old Scottish working class tradition of the importance of education, of the democratic intellect as it's been called here, obviously went straight into his bones. So it's no surprise that people who uh, have developed a, a sense of uh, social justice uh, through the trade union movement in Scotland would know of and would associate with the, the views and the teachings of, of James Connolly as they would do with the Red Clyde Siders, uh, with John McLean, uh, people who are held up and, and considered to be central to the development of the trade union and labour movement in Scotland. So Connolly would, would be there with them. Um, he, he was born in this country. He learned his socialism uh, through life in Edinburgh and the, the trade union movement in Scotland very much see him as part of the, the development of, uh, of their uh, traditions. There are many people within the labour movement in Scotland, especially in the west of Scotland, who can claim Irish background. Uh, the great Scottish socialist John McLean is venerated as a Scottish Republican socialist. Um, he acknowledged Connolly at every turn. Uh, John McLean didn't ever identify himself with the Labour Party, but he did with the cause of socialism. Spent time in jail. Uh, he, he wasn't a particularly strong uh, person in, in terms of physique, but in terms of intellect and determination, he was a giant. And the fact that he recognised the qualities in James Connolly, I think is the biggest compliment that anybody can give. The dates begin to slot into place when he comes out of the army and meets this very important man, John Leslie, of Irish descent himself, Irish, old Fenian, um, who's a very important mentor to, to Connolly. There was an element of social radicalism in Fenianism, especially, I think, in Fenianism in, the United, Fenianism in Britain, as we think from Fenianism in Ireland. Um, but it's hard to get away from the fact, unless it was that he picked it up in the British Army, it's hard to get away from the fact that um, Leslie was probably the de decisive influence on him. But in the case of Leslie, he could see somebody who was making sense of this and arguing that what you need to do was to accept the revolutionary potential in Irish nationalist sentiment, but make it something in which you have the working class organising against capitalists, including Irish capitalists. You get a sense of him becoming very angry with the Irish Home Rule Organisation in Edinburgh, the United Irish League as it had become, because in some of the local elections that Connolly was involved in, um, they urged their membership to support Liberal candidates against socialists, and Connolly felt they were letting down, they were dividing the Irish community in Edinburgh, uh, playing along too much with the priests. He, he was on record saying that. The poor law elections in early 1895. Here he was defeated by a Monsignor Grady, which again led to divisions and led to castigation of Connolly in relation to Connolly the Communist, Connolly the Marxist, Connolly the Socialist. Daddy was angry. There's no end to the lies and terrible things that they say about me, Lily. It makes me angry because I know they say those things because I'm a socialist. A socialist, Daddy? What's that? A socialist? No, no, said Daddy. Is a person who wants to change things so that everyone, every man, every woman, 
every boy and girl will have enough to eat, and that no little boy or girl will have to go barefoot or without clothes. That's what a socialist is. No, no. But everyone should want that, said no, no. Have you told everyone? To be an international labour organiser in those days, you had to be mobile, you had to be international. But James was precocious in as much as he identified the cause of labour with the cause of Ireland, and the cause of Ireland with the cause of labour. It's, it's, it's his famous statement. John Leslie uh, actually wrote a wonderful tribute to him in the Justice magazine where he described Connolly as a man among men. He said that he was the most able uh, socialist propagandist. And uh, following on from this article in Justice, uh, Eureka, a message comes from Dublin, from the Dublin Socialist Club, offering Connolly a job as an organiser for a wage of one pound per week. They'd only been there for a few months when Conway persuaded them to change the name to the Irish Socialist Republican Party. H.M. Heinemann, the widow of the British Social Democratic Federation, allegedly a Marxist organisation, was a real chauvinist. And in 1896, when the Irish Socialist Party was set up, Conway published a manifesto for the new party. And although Heinemann didn't attack Connolly by name, he attacked the manifesto. And he said it was quite preposterous that there should be any mention of Irish independence in a socialist manifesto issued within the British Empire. He called for the nationalisation of railways and canals. He called for the replacement of private banks by state ones with popularly elected boards of directors that would issue loans at cost. He called for a graduated income tax on all incomes over £300 in order to pay pensions to the aged, infirm, widows and orphans. He talked about the establishment of a minimum wage and a 48-hour week. He talked about free maintenance for all children. He talked about gradual extension of the principle of public ownership to all the necessaries of life. He looked for free education up to the highest university grades, and he also called for universal suffrage. Dominic Bean sang this song to me in Shepherd's Bush, London, in 1968, and he wrote the first two verses. There is a page in history who when the workers first fought back when the might of exploitation at last began to crack in farm and field and factory in workshop mine and mill a flame was lit a beacon bright and that flame it's burning still and Connolly was there and Connolly was there brave and undaunted James Connolly was there William Martin Murphy and his Dublin millionaires tried bribery and corruption, hypocrisy and prayers to break the transport union and the scabs they did enlist. But all their graft was shattered by a scarlet iron fist. And Connolly was there, Connolly was there, brave and undaunted, James Connolly was there. They executed Connolly in May 1916. United workers of the world, they still revere his name. In farm and field and factory, in workshop, mine and mill. That blazing light, that beacon bright, that flame, it's burning still. 
and Connolly will be there. Connolly will be there. Brave and undaunted, James Connolly will be there. People like Redmond were very conscious of uh, Connolly and his agitation for socialism. He also, of course, would have become known and become a friend of Maud Gahan and uh, got involved in many campaigns. Uh, one of them was, of course, for the extension of the uh, Act passed at Parliament uh, for the provision of meals for school children. He got involved in that project uh, with Maud Gahan, and also, of course, he got involved in the uh, demonstration against Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. As far back as 1897, uh, there was James Connolly, quite clearly identifying himself as a non-supporter of Queen Victoria, becoming involved in demonstrations and so on. And so the response to him then was to, uh, given that he edited a very important newspaper, a very influential newspaper, uh, was to destroy his printing press. And so he decided to come on a tour of Scotland looking for funds. And during that visit, he met Keir Hardy, uh, who gave him £50, which was quite something then and therefore carried on the democratic socialist evolution. It was never a revolution, really, if it wasn't democratic. Um, and therefore the, uh, the link between Keir Hardy here in Scotland and James Connolly was clearly very, very strong. Irish nationalism has been stymied by the collapse of the Parnell movement. So he's offering a strategy for an island in which the land war is over, the Home Rule Party is shattered. There are new ideas coming in. Socialism, feminism, new ideas in literature, new ideas in relation between culture and society, culture and politics. He's offering a synthesis which will draw people together around the idea of an Irish workers' republic. That the, the way to free Ireland is to mobilise the workers of Ireland who have no interest other than in ending the capitalism. Capital and capitalism in Ireland is foreign. It's imposed by the British Empire, by British imperialism. In 1897, um, Alice Milligan offered James Connolly his first space in Irish print in the Sean van Vogt, which was an extremely radical thing to do, not least because of, of, of Connolly's overt Republican politics. Um, the two journals that he publishes, um, the first is called Socialism and Nationalism, um, and the second is called Patriotism and Labour. Um, in Socialism and Nationalism, um, it's important because he, he defines the Irish revival. He talks about Irish language movements, the literary societies, the commemoration committees. Um, he says that, the, you know, that this, this cultural revival is absolutely fundamental in the transformation of, of Irish society. He's a Marxist. Marxism is an extremely rich and important body of thought, but it's incomplete. There are problems Marxism doesn't answer. If you want to, as a Marxist, to address these problems, you have to bring in ideas from other sources. Uh, and later in the 20th century, we're used to the idea of people like Lukács, Gramsci, and others who, who had a cultural critique of capitalism and saw culture as the context in which class struggle took place. Connolly doesn't have access to any of that. He's got to bring in ideas from elsewhere to make Marxism address the problems of Ireland. But he says that, um, without, uh, that, that there is a danger in which uh, it, it could simply commemorate something that is, is a dead culture and therefore become something like a commemorative tradition that is not related to what he called vital living issues. Um, so what he, he, he does is he defines, um, he says that the revival needs to be engaged in a much more um, politically focused movement and it needs to direct it, its kind of its cultural activism um, and make the republic their goal is what he says. He says it's not a republic that we should base on France or the United States 
He says, no, the republic I wish our fellow countrymen to set before them as their ideal should be of such a character that the mere mention of its name uh, would all time serve as a beacon light to the oppressed of every land. He goes back to ideas of Irish history, of, of the Celtic culture of, of, of Ireland, and particularly the idea of Celtic communism, the, the communal land ownership of the ancient Irish. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, he's bringing ideas, as Bernard Ransom said in his book on Connellism Marxism, he's bringing in an ethical critique of capitalism from basically Catholic and Christian sources. So he's putting together a synthesis of ideas which had not been put together before. Most Marxists who encountered these ideas at first rejected them because they thought it was very simple. The only thing that mattered was working class struggle in factories. You couldn't get anywhere in Ireland with, that, that, with Marxism of that kind. Connolly going to America, uh, it, it consists of two things really. One is desperation for funds. He's got to make a living somehow and the lecture tour is a way of putting some money together. Uh, and secondly, uh, America was a very exciting place uh, for a socialist to be in the period 1890 to 1920. And in the five months of his absence, giving lectures for which he was paid a minimal amount, the Dublin organization of the Republican Socialist Party really withered, and he was very annoyed about that, very angry. Well, a bit of a fallout between him and them. Conaway was one of the great intellectuals, one of the great Irish intellectuals, self-taught, but an intellectual. And if you look at his, if you look at just some of his articles, the man's the range of the man's diverse interests are, are, are simply staggering. He, he was a brilliant communicator. That's why De Leon invited him to America. De Leon, a very, very um, charismatic figure. Somebody who still had his impact 30 and 40 years after he was dead. Um, somebody who was producing original Marxist theoretics for Connolly. And the only original Marxist Connolly had actually met was himself, so to speak, uh, before that. Uh, from Connolly's point of view, a figure like this, so cosmopolitan in his culture, and De Leon was, after all, a Jewish intellectual, a university lecturer, and so forth, um, but behind it, a uh, fairly restrictive, you've got to do what I say, my form of Marxism is the right kind of Marxism to have. Connolly's relationship with Daniel De Leon deteriorated rapidly, and you could say by the end they detested each other. And it was really rooted in two or three key disputes they had about the nature of socialist politics and the nature of trade union organization. But he began as an admirer of Daniel De Leon, and he admired many of the things that Daniel De Leon did. And Daniel De Leon's uh, approach to industrial rather than craft unionism was something that Connolly uh, brought forward in all his trade union work. American socialism uh, tended to be, it tended to be very sectarian. Um, and, um, a great deal depended on uh, how the Marxist version of socialism was interpreted. And Daniel de Leon was perhaps the most, um, the most uh, strong-minded uh, of the Marxist socialists in America, uh, the most opinionated, and the one who thought that he had the real truth behind what Marx was saying. And um, Connolly was initially attracted by uh, de Leon's thoroughness uh, and by his, his concern to get theory right. But he quickly found that De Leon was, in fact, uh, as some of his enemies called him, the Pope of Socialism, and that he would brook absolutely no opposition. And in the end, of course, De Leon's socialism tended to be too purist in a way. Uh, he had little time for labor unions as such, uh, had no conception that syndicalism might be a way forward. Whereas Connolly tended to be, for a man who was very interested in understanding uh, theory, understanding economic causation, he was a great pragmatist. On the eve of uh, Lily preparing the family to travel to meet James in New York, and Mona uh, called little Maureen uh, in Nora's account in por portrait of a rebel father, she decided to play house 
and uh, her apron caught on fire and uh, she was engulfed in flames. Uh, she ran out screaming hysterically out into the back garden and the man who was cutting a hedge a few doors down heard the screams, uh, vaulted over the hedges and tried to put out the fire. The next day they were brought to Aunt Alice's house. There was a crowd in the house and in the parlour a coffin and in the coffin was Mona looking so strange and white and her lower lip bitten tight with her teeth. Mama stood at the head of the coffin and her face was white and stiff and her eyes bright and staring. Then they went to the graveyard and Mona was buried. Can you imagine the scene from an emotional point of view of Connolly, joyous with expectation and anticipation of his family arriving through quarantine in Ellis Island and when Lily announced that they had lost their eldest child, he said, as I had read in the correspondence, it darkened his life forever. I have emerged out of the depths, else I would not have written to you. And I'm sorely troubled by my health, which has indeed given me great trouble of late. As you gathered from my letter, I, I do not like the country. Indeed, my chief motive in coming here was to provide a better field for my girls than was open for them at home. But the girl, for whose immediate benefit the change was made, was stricken down by death on the eve of her departure. And the blow darkened my life and changed all our hopes and prospects. Another of the great lost hopes of American labour was the IWW, the Wobblies. Everyone on the left invested hugely in the Wobblies. And again, it was a mark of James as an organiser because they were facing not just police reaction, not just the reaction of owners, but they were, this was a pitched battle, an almost continuous pitched battle. It was the most radical organisation in the world, much more radical than the Communist Party, because, of course, the Communist Party was really keeping on so many of the structures of existing states, including the secret police. The IWW ultimately wanted to see a world government with very, very little government about it because the workers themselves were supposed to be so educated in what their duties were to other workers that they wouldn't want to swindle each other that you didn't have the old evil of incipient capitalism anywhere. It appealed to Connolly because it was an organisation that reached out across divisions inside the working class. So for Connolly, the notion of um, a working class movement that only represented the elite was something that he couldn't stomach. And so the IWW was his pattern of how trade union organisation ought to work. The IWW was as far-sighted a utopian ideal as you could ask, and yet it was the very latest thing in socialism. Anarcho, meaning that you would have the withering away of the state. Syndicalism, meaning that you would have the factory owned by the workers who are operating in it. And it also meant that you were, Connolly himself, was conscious of the fact that the Irish were migrant workers, after all his people had settled in Edinburgh, and from the very first he was interested in the word spalpeen in the Irish language, which of course in its most famous usage in poetry is on spalpeen fánach, the wandering worker. Um, so he automatically saw where so much of the labour movement could go by and identifying with the nomads in the United States. Taught himself German taught himself French, and then he taught himself Italian. Uh, and I, I, I just say to myself, where, the, where did the man get the energy from? In circumstances of extreme poverty. If you look at the Communist Manifesto, if you, if you read the Communist Manifesto, there are quite famous statements where Marx and Engels say, where they attack national languages, attack the Celtic fringe. You know, there's no place for small nations in the world anymore. There's no place for national... Uh, uh, there's no place for minority languages. Now, Connolly challenges this argument head on without mentioning Marx or Engels. Nora attended her father's meetings whenever possible. They went out of town one Sunday, but only a trolley ride. 
to a meeting of Italians. On the way, Daddy said, I'm going to give them a surprise. They're expecting a speaker, but they don't know me at all. What's the surprise? asked No No. You're going to get it too, he answered, <laughs> laughing, and no coaxing would make him tell. The hall was crowded. Daddy went to the platform and began speaking. That was a surprise. He was speaking Italian. First of all, he would have written for the weekly and daily people, the Socialist Labour Party, but the paper he founded himself was the Harp when he set up an Irish Socialist Federation to organise Irish immigrant workers, both to support the struggle back in Ireland itself and to support the struggle for socialism within, within the United States and to cooperate with other ethnic groups in that struggle. But what Connolly was using the Harp for was to say, OK, we, I am speaking primarily to Irish Americans, but I'm speaking well beyond that to the people I want them to be working with. That's to say the other immigrants of recognisable ethnic antecedents who have their own stories and their own paths to cherish and to need, like the Irish, to use that past to tell themselves that they're going to fight for workers' ownership of the world. He wrote a number of books dealing with uh, both Irish history. Uh, his most famous one is called Labour and Irish History. And this was uh, an attempt by James Connolly to put in a Marxist interpretation of Irish history, where he put uh, working people back into the picture. He puts the small farmers back into the picture. Uh, up until then, uh, Irish history was, d d was about the big people in history, uh, where Connolly basically exposed the the likes of Daniel O'Connell and all these others as for what they were. He applied what was a self-taught mind to problems of Irish history and transformed it, that you constantly find ways in which he's anticipated later historians, even on the extraordinary point about did the Pope actually bring the Normans to Ireland in 1169? Uh, with the dispute as to whether the bull out was, uh, was, was, was forged or not. And it is Connolly who says, but there are three other bulls from the next Pope Alexander III not only ratifying the invasion, but threatening to excommunicate anybody who was opposed to it. Therefore, it doesn't matter whether it's a forgery or not. And so, in a sense, he sweeps aside an unproductive antiquarian controversy and puts his heart on what the reality is. Now, to think of God Connolly as leading the way for medieval Irish historians sounds dotty. On the contrary, it was a very clear head and a very good historical sense. Connolly's views on religion are often put in two different camps. One is that he had abandoned his religion and he was a socialist and he just merely took the pose of a Catholic. And the other is that he was always religious and he continued to practice right up until, until he took the last rites. The truth is probably that he had a more nuanced position than that. And it's one that we can understand in the modern world where people do have multiple identities and they define themselves in a whole range of complex ways. And clearly Conley, as an Irish immigrant, viewed himself as being part of that community and culturally he viewed himself as a, as a Catholic. And he would have been very up on all the debates going on within the church regarding workers' rights. But Connolly was always clear. It wasn't practising Catholics that were problems. It was the established church, the hierarchy of the church, who paid no interest in what was happening to the working class and were prepared to turn a blind eye. Connolly made it absolutely clear in some of his writings that he did not see that the the pursuit of socialism and the belief in any religion, regardless of what that uh, religion was, uh, should be at odds. All he asked is that people look beyond their religion to the desire for uh, socialism. And therefore, he would have been quite comfortable in, in people having both a religious view of life, but also uh, an experiential socialist uh, view of, of uh, the circumstances in which they lived. He would have wanted them to use both in order to drive forward uh, the pursuit of social justice. At the same time in his book, uh, <coughs> Labour, Nationality and Religion, Connolly argued that there was no, there's no contradiction, there's no antagonism between a sincere belief in, in a religious belief and an actual having a revolutionary socialist idea of a, the social transformation of society. He may, for a period of about 15 years, not have actually attended uh, to any religious duties, but in many respects, uh, the, the culture of religion would st have stayed with them. Oh, where, oh, where is our James Connolly? Oh, where, oh, where 
is that gallant man he has gone to organize the union that working man might yet be free and where oh where is the citizen army oh where oh where is that gallant band they have gone to join the great rebellion and smash the bonds of slavery. that you hope the matter has not knocked me about in any way. Well, it has. It has upset me entirely. It has aroused the call of Erin in my blood until I'm always dreaming of Ireland, dreaming of going back to the fight at home. Now, you know I have a way of trying to realize my dreams. I think I will try and realize this one. I see my way by the time this tour has ended, if not before, to raise my passage money. But I do not see my way to live after I once more set foot on Irish soil. And that part of the problem is the hardest, as, of course, I could not go into the slums of Dublin again to live. One experience of that is enough for a lifetime. My children are now growing up, and it is part of my creed that when I have climbed any part of the ladder towards social comfort, I must never descend it again. So the problem of repatriating myself is difficult. My present pay is, as when I came to America first, three dollars per day and expenses. I know that if I reach Ireland, I would be lucky if I could scrape up half of that. But I'm not satisfied here. And have not near the enthusiasm for the fight that I had in Ireland, and I want to get amongst people with whom I feel I have more in common. And Connolly himself was to say once that it was a sorry day he ever went to America and it was a sorrier day that he left it. But whether that was a joke or not, one, one isn't sure. And Connolly heard that in Ireland, the labor movement was changing spectacularly. James Larkin, from Liverpool originally, building up the Irish Transport and General Workers Union with tremendous strength and force in Ireland itself. His elephant trumpet-like call was turning statutory, pessimistic, hopeless workers into an extremely effective industrial union. And from Connolly's point of view, uh, there was a great deal to be said for this, but there are no signs of Larkin being a particularly impressive theoretician. He's a wonderful organiser, he's a wonderful agitator. So Connolly wants to come back in in order to fight for this principle of Marxist socialism at the heart of Irish labour and at the heart of Irish nationalism. 
So he goes back to Ireland and immediately gets the job of organising in Belfast itself. volunteers were beginning to form, the Orangemen were beginning to mobilize, because since 1910, the Liberals no longer had an absolute majority in the government, and the Irish Parliamentary Party therefore were holding the balance of power, and the Irish Parliamentary Party had always promised home rule when they would get power, and now they had to deliver, and therefore the Ulster Protestant workers were terrified that their jobs were going to go to Catholics. He strove very, very, very hard to bring uh, Catholics and Protestants together. Um, he, uh, he understood that. He wrote a series of articles in newspapers in Belfast um, uh, a dialogue with a man called William Walker. William Walker was a, we would suppose you could describe him as an Orange Socialist. He believed that socialism could be, could be brought to Ireland through, uh, without breaking the connection with the, with the Empire. Uh, so Connolly argued that you couldn't bring socialism to a, a, uh, to an, uh, to a country which was occupied and colonised by a foreign power. Hateful though imperialism might be to socialists, uh, to some working people imperialism wasn't a bad thing. Uh, after all, Belfast had enjoyed its economic growth on the backs of the on, on the strength of the British Empire, and the idea that the empire should be attacked was something that uh, would make for heavy going for any socialist. And I think that Connolly didn't take into his sufficient account the grip that imperialism had on the working class mind in Belfast. He had contempt for the Home Rule movement. He had contempt for it because its aspirations were so limited. It wanted Ireland to have a devolved parliament within the United Kingdom, what Scotland and Wales have now, effectively. Uh, he wanted Ireland to be independent, uh, an independent republic, because only then could there be sufficient control of Irish land and resources to be sure that those resources were used for the people of Ireland. So the Home Rule movement for him was selling the past right away by accepting remaining within the structure of the, 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 the United Kingdom. And secondly, he's contemptuous of the compromises, the, the, the way in which the Home Rule Party at Westminster really becomes absorbed into the culture of Westminster. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's an old problem, the Westminster Parliament. Rebels go to that Parliament and they're taken over. A lot of people seem to believe that had we got Home Rule, that would have evolved into independence. Such people know nothing about the economic background because, in fact, um, yeah, Home Rule Ireland would eventually have been submerged by the welfare state with huge subsidies from Britain, which Northern Ireland has to this day, and we would never have been able to get out from under because of the cost. I don't think our people would ever have made the break. much with women. It's well known, of course, that Countess Markovic was one of the workers under his direction in the Irish Citizen Army and in the workers' movement. But she was only one. Uh, his wife, who had obviously a very tough life indeed, was somebody who had become necessarily a volunteer recruit in his work. His daughters grew up that way and so forth. Um, he took his place alongside men working for women's rights, notably, of course, his very dear friend, Francis Sheehy Skeffington, um, who he thought was still alive during the Rising, and whom he wanted to edit his speeches afterwards. Now, of course, feminism was the greatest thing in Skeffington's life, 
and for Connolly to want to do that is a direct identification of him with Skeffington. I think that anything that James Connolly did, and including his nationalism, was absolutely located within his socialism. Um, and the same can be said for his approach to, f to feminism. And I think that's what made James Connolly absolutely unique in his days, because there was lots of fellow socialists who supported feminism, um, but he located it squarely within, f within, within socialism and within the national question, and was very much of the opinion that women had a role to play, in, not just in economic uh, life, but also in political life. He was very much uh, a man ahead of his times, and I think he was both a family man and a man who uh, was definitely a feminist and wanted to see equality between the sexes, uh, which was probably extremely progressive when you think of the lack of representation, the lack of franchise indeed by women in, in those times. Uh, and it's just, again, I think history would have been very different in this country if you had Connolly leading. He believed in fully equality. His own daughter, Nora in particular, was a close political associate. In the United States, he promoted Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, later a leader of, of the American Communist Party. He was truly extraordinary to see the kind of statements he was making on behalf of women. Uh, even the, the, the proclamation that was read out uh, outside the GPO starts with the principle of equality between men and women. I have no doubt that is a direct result of James Connolly's thinking, because certainly many of the other leaders didn't share that view. There were 220 Irish citizen army who took part in the Rising, and not many people know that uh, 22 of those were actually women. In the face of a certain amount of resistance uh, from other trade unionists who didn't see equality for women as being desirable at all. Uh, he at times got quite angry on the issue and he described women at one stage as the slaves of wage slaves. And he believed that the, the whole uh, push for women's liberation was inextricably linked with the, the drive for true freedom for working class people in Ireland. The formation of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union in 1909 uh, was very significant because it radically transformed Irish labour. It came as a whirlwind. It was informed really by four tenants that distinguished it from previous Irish organisations, and there had been previous Irish organisations. It was an Irish union for Irish workers, um, which was not without precedent, but it was an Irish union for Irish workers informed by a socialist perspective. This was not just about uh, the slice of the cake, it was about who controlled the, ho the holding of the knife. It was uh, an Irish Union for Irish Workers inspired by socialist uh, politics and militant industrial unionism. An injury to one was an injury to all. And finally, of course, it was an Irish Union of Irish Workers distinguished by uh, a desire for self-determination. Now, the employers probably cottoned onto this even before the workers did because in 1909 in Cork, almost as soon as the union was created and appeared in the city in strength, the Cork employers combined and effectively uh, ran the tactics that we're more familiar with from 1913, a lockout combination of employers and attempt to smash the union, which was nearly successful. In Wexford in 1911, a similar thing occurred. The Wexford Iron Foundry employers uh, combined to lock out the, uh, the workforce and used the familiar tactics of starvation and in particular mass uh, police presence and the importation of scabs. I heard a lot of it from my cradle upwards, if you like, I heard nothing else only about the 1911 lockout. A lot of commentators, incidentally, refer to the 1911 strike. There was never a strike in Wexford. They were locked out. Now, what happened was this. Transport Union came to town in the beginning of August or June, June in 1911, and they organised the dockers, particularly on the quay. That time, that was a busy port, Wexford. And... Uh, Towards the end of August, the, the, uh, some men in Pierce's joined the union. And Pierce's heard about it, and he sacked them. And uh, he gave them an option, like, if they wanted their jobs, they could have nothing to do with the union. And the men stayed in the union. And then a week after that, he put up a notice, he was closing, and he locked them out. The hero, uh, not least in the eyes of the Wexford workers, was P.T. Daly, uh, who suffered imprisonment, but also uh, being uh, waylaid by the proprietor of the local newspaper and a sidekick one night and, and literally beaten uh, within an inch of his life. 
wages were low, hours were long, you'd, had, you'd talk about a 12-hour day, you would talk about, I'm sure in many places, overtime being done and not being paid for, never mind talk about time and a half or anything like that, they just weren't paid. They had no strength. There were men who were not educated because the working classes at that time didn't have the opportunity for education. It was very minimal. So, as I say, it was a bubble waiting to, to burst. In the period of Daly's absence, Connolly was sent down. And I think uh, the Wexford lockout indicates an aspect of Connolly's life which is perhaps slightly disregarded or underregarded, and that is his capacity as an industrial official because it was Connolly that brought the settlement of the Wexford lockout on predictably imaginative and unusual terms. Basically, the two sides had slugged it out to the extent that there was, there was an impasse, a stalemate. The employers, whilst they were probably desiring of a settlement, couldn't swallow the pill of recognising the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union. And as a consequence, uh, Connolly came up with this, the alternative solution of the creation of the Irish Foundry Workers' Union. Uh, I think a wonderful um, e uh, event that, again, uh, illustrates uh, the, the imaginative and uh, all-embracing aspect of Connolly's perception of organisation. On the night that the lockout um, ended, uh, 5,000 people uh, marched around the town with, uh, with flambeaux and tar barrels. And... Um, they gathered at the Fife and various speeches were made, including a very conciliatory speech by Connolly, who was desirous of winning the peace as well as the war. And at the end of it, the crowd were invited to sing, led by Richard Corish, a song printed and distributed, I think, for a halfpenny or a penny a copy for the strike fund to the crowd, who all sang en masse a Connolly composition, We Are Freedom's Pioneers. Our feet upon the upward path are set when none may tread. Save those who to the rich man's wrath dare turn rebellious head. And heart does brave no cringing slave in all our ranks appears. Our proudest boast is labor's host, where freedom's pioneer. James Connolly was the founder of the Labour Party. The uh, Labour Party was founded in 1912. It was a decision of the then Irish Trade Union Con Congress to establish a political party. It wasn't done at the first go. Uh, both James Connolly and Jim Larkin had a number of attempts to persuade their colleagues to establish a political party. Uh, and the reason for that was that both Connolly and Larkin recognised uh, that the fighting for workers' rights, uh, defending workers' interests, defending the interests of working people, uh, that part of that had to be done by way of political action. And 1913 was a, a very historic year in the life of James Connolly. In January, he contested the municipal election for the Dock Ward in Belfast. Uh, he was defeated by a unionist candidate who achieved over 1,500 votes. Connolly uh, won 900 uh, votes, which was significant enough again for the politics, of course, that he upheld. In March of that year, he uh, was um, a delegate representing the uh, Irish Transport uh, Union at the uh, Congress of the Irish TUC in Cork. During the summer of that year, um, there were massive tensions, uh, particularly in Dublin City. Uh, and, of course, uh, on the 26th of August, uh, Larkin uh, called out the men in the Dublin tramways. Murphy recognised his enemy, and learning the lessons from Cork and Wexford combined employers together. Without any sense of irony, over 400 employers used the weapon of combination to deny the same basic right to workers and then were prepared to enforce that through starvation. Murphy knew well that the class enemy was, was Larkin and Connolly. He knew well that if this uh, dispute was not won, if the transport union was not snuffed out, uh, then a permanent threat to his hegemony, whether in an independent Ireland or not, would be lost. Nona was tingling. She had come to Dublin and was at the centre of the fight. But that was due to Daddy. He took her here, there and everywhere. Liberty Hall was the starting point. It was the home of the Transport Union. 
and the halls, the corridors, the staircase, and all around it were thronged with lockout workers. The sense of struggle, the grim determination of the workers, the cheerful acceptance of hardships endured enveloped Nono, and their deep regard and respect for Daddy won her heart. Nono knew how right the man in Belfast was who called him General Connolly. Connolly uh, and Larkin addressed the meeting outside Liberty Hall and on the following day, towards the end of August, he was arrested. He refused to basically guarantee good behaviour and uh, uh, so he was uh, given a sentence and incarcerated in uh, Mount Joy. September 1913. What need you being come to sense but fumble in a greasy till and add the halfpence to the pence and prayer to shivering prayer until you have dried the marrow from the bone for men were born to pray and save. Romantic Ireland's dead and gone. It's with O'Leary in the grave. The following uh, Sunday it was Bloody Sunday in Dublin uh, where Larkin appeared at the prohibited meeting uh, on the balcony of the Imperial Hotel and of course the uh, baton charges from the Metropolitan Police uh, led to some deaths. So it was an, uh, an appalling time for uh, workers in Dublin. Yet they were of a different kind, the names that stilled your childish play. They have gone about the world like wind, but little time had they to pray for whom the hangman's rope was spun. And what, God help us, could they save? Romantic Ireland's dead and gone. It's with O'Leary in the grave. By January, uh, February 1914, uh, the game is up. Um, both sides are exhausted. The union begins to have to ask itself, you know, how much more can it ask of its troops? The financial aid, which was different to the food, the financial aid that was coming in every week from the TUC, uh, from the British street collections, was winding out, and they had to make a decision. Toughest decision for any trade union leader, uh, not to know when to advance, but to know when to retreat. Was it for this the wild geese spread the grey wing upon every tide? For this that all blood was shed? For this Edward Fitzgerald died? and Robert Emmett, and Wolf Tone. All that delirium of the brave, romantic Ireland's dead and gone. It's with O'Leary in the grave. The employers of Dublin, uh, led by William Martin Murphy, had effectively defeated uh, Connolly's union in that, in, in that strike. It was a huge, long strike. Uh, we look back on it now in very, very heroic terms, but the strike ended in failure. The, the employees had to, had to go back. Yet could we turn the years again and call those exiles as they were in all their loneliness and pain, you'd cry, some woman's yellow hair has maddened every mother's son. They weighed so lightly what they gave, but let them be, they're dead and gone. They're with O'Leary in the grave. His relationship with James Larkin was a very tempestuous one. I mean, he saw that Larkin was the man who was inspiring the unorganized, the great mass of unorganized workers uh, with his oratory. But he also found him an impossible man uh, to work with. And he said that at one stage, uh, Larkin seemed to want a Larkinite movement rather than a democratic workers' movement. Uh, and uh, he also felt that Larkin was putting him down and uh, was using P.T. Daly to play off against him. Huge personality conflicts, and I think these might have caused problems had Connolly survived, or perhaps Connolly would have been strong enough and the absolute leader of the labour movement had he survived. There was that division of temperament and personality, and you couldn't gloss that over, uh, even though they're both giants of our, 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 our unions and uh, the Irish working class movement's historic tradition. Larkin himself, as an agitator, was phenomenally successful. Uh, dark, um, constantly almost impossible to catch, uh, frequently producing glorious confrontations, marvellous crowd oratory, 
wonderful ridicule. And of course, there was even the fact that Larkin, at one stage in the course of the proceedings, and nobody could find him, was stretched out in the drawing room of Vice Regal Lodge, where the Marchioness of Aberdeen was entertaining him and finding it interesting to talk to this charming man. When her husband discovered whom she had been entertaining, the Lord Lieutenant, and when um, the Chief Secretary, Augustine Birrell, heard it, they nearly died. Connolly, from a very early stage, despaired of Larkin's hot-headedness and his, his lack of strategic thinking. And uh, we can see this very clearly in his letters and exchanges with William O'Brien, that the two of them thought that Larkin was a great uh, fomenter, uh, but a hopeless uh, administrator, if you like. To make matters worse, I confess to you in confidence that I don't think I can stand Larkin as boss much longer. He's simply unbearable. He's forever snarling at me and drawing comparisons between what he accomplished in Belfast in 1907 and what I have done, conveniently ignoring the fact that he was then secretary of an English organisation and that as soon as he started an Irish one, his union fell to pieces and he had to leave the members to their fate. He's consumed with jealousy and hatred of anyone who will not cringe to him. I would formerly have trusted his generosity in financial matters. Now I would not trust him at all. Larkin seems to think he can use socialists as he pleases, and then, when his end is served, throw them out if they will not bow down to his majesty. Well, he will never get me to bow. Well, Connolly's leadership of the locker was extremely brilliant. Uh, he, he really kept his head when Larkin didn't keep his. Um, and of course one of the most important byproducts of the lockout uh, is one of the most important undertakings that Connolly ever set about and that was the foundation of the Irish Citizen Army which was, was very much his creation. And um, the Citizen Army, designed as a force to protect striking workers, ultimately is seen by him and indeed becomes a kind of a, a, a revolutionary uh, body. Um, very, very disciplined, although very small, perhaps the most impressive force leading up to 1916. But it comes directly out of the lockout. When Larkin goes to America in 1914, Connolly becomes the leading figure in the Citizen's Army and almost immediately begins to transform the army from uh, perhaps the joke to some extent that it was. People were amused by these people wandering around the city doing drills to become uh, very much part and parcel of his ultimate ambition for insurrection, however much that was known. And this is very clear in the, uh, w the newspaper, The Workers' Republic, which followed the suppression of the Irish worker. Uh, Connolly produces The Workers' Republic uh, for the Union and has a, a regular column on the Citizens' Army and a regular column on street warfare, guerrilla tactics, etc. The Citizens' Army becomes very much integral to Connolly's uh, ultimate ambition for the rising. Connolly, in 1914, suffered two hammer blows to everything he believed in. Firstly, he had really thought that all of the workers in these islands would come together to fight in the course of the Dublin lockout and strike. Now, of course, what Larkin and Connolly were both saying was, we want a revolutionary world. We are not just doing what Irish labor has been doing up to now, which is to get larger and larger slices of the capitalist cake, and no more than that. And the union bosses in Britain, very many of them Irish, when they were called on to support Larkin's workers driven out of their jobs and so forth in, in, in Dublin, they helped to a certain degree, but ultimately they turned their backs on it. And in a way, they turned their backs on it, knowing that Larkin and Connolly, when you got right down to it, were the enemies who, if successful, would sweep them and their form of labor, larger slice of the cake capitalism, out of sight. So Connolly suddenly realized that he could no longer rely on the workers in the island in which he had been born, Britain. He also had to face it that when war actually broke out in August 1914, what he had believed couldn't happen did happen. The workers flocked to the colours, many of them, of course, in Dublin because they were out of jobs anyway. They took up the guns and started shooting each other. The 
the First World War was an absolute disaster, not simply because it was a horrendous event in itself, but because it destroyed the international socialist movement. What Connolly would have believed coming up to 1914 and the outbreak of the war was that as the big powers in Europe began to mobilize, the working classes in each of the individual countries would refuse to fight, would join hands across the borders and would overthrow their masters. So that the, the war would be the signal really for a kind of international revolution. Instead what happened of course was that the war was the signal for the collapse of the international socialist movement, the workers flocked into the armies of uh, the big empires um, and nationalism trumped socialism. Once the war comes and once he moves closer to the old Fenians, the Irish Republican Brotherhood's inner council, who are already planning a rising, and we know what road, that's the road that takes them to the execution yard in Kilmainham. But we'll never know for certain what actually happened when uh, Connolly had that sort of three-day meeting with the IRB military council. Uh, but from the context, I think it's pretty clear what was being discussed. Effectively, what the IRB, uh, plan who are planning the, to have their own rising, what they were concerned about was they knew that Connolly was, was, uh, was, was planning to go before them. He had been uh, very openly militant. He had been demanding a rising. And what they were afraid of was that Connolly was going to go ahead. Uh, he was going to provoke repression uh, from the authorities and that, that would scupper their plans, that they would all be arrested and their plans for a rising around Easter time uh, would fail even before they got off the ground. Pierce, who was making fine speeches, was once interrupted by Connolly, who said, you know, is there going to be anything more than speeches? Uh, is there going to be a rising now? The place for Ireland's battle is here. Therefore, the IRB, who are thinking about a rising, became extremely worried that Connolly would set off a premature one. Not only does he force the agenda, he also forces the timing. Um, and of course his own commitment to revolution at that stage, in a sense, is, it, it grows out of, uh, not so much out of revolutionary fear, but then out of despair, uh, because the world war was wreaking such havoc on labour movements everywhere. And indeed on the labour movement in Ireland itself, with so many people joining up. I mean, the transport union itself was not only badly shaken and defeated in the lockout, but it was just as badly um, brought down by, by, by the massive uh, enlistment of, of working people in the British Army during the First World War. So there was a sense in which, you know, Connolly striking out was almost inevitable, um, that he was impelled to it by the, the, the havoc that the war was creating on the labour and the international labour movement. He thinks that Dublin can be the spark that's going to light this conflagration of revolution throughout Europe uh, that will not burn out, as he says, until the last uh, throne and the last capitalist bond and debenture has been scorched on the funeral pyre uh, of the last warlord. So, so he has this apocalyptic vision, really, that what's going to happen in Dublin is, is, is going to light the, the fuse and a revolution is, 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 is going to come out of it around Europe. If Connolly had survived, if the uh, rising had been more successful, if a new Irish free state had emerged then rather than 1922, that Connolly would have ended up in jail or being exiled. Connolly really doesn't fit very easily with, with the mainstream of the sort of radical nationalist leaders. You have to remember a lot of these people would have opposed him uh, during the Great Lockout in Dublin in 1913, not, not Pierce, but a lot of the others did, the general sort of tenor of Irish nationalism at that time sees the class struggle uh, as being wrong and as being a distraction from the main issue, which is getting the Brits out. Um, he, you know, he's been in polemical battles with a lot of these people for a long time. So, in one sense, they're not natural allies. Um, and Connolly really moves into their circle. I think, more out of a sense of despair than out of a sense of hope. Connolly said to his own people in the Citizen Army, he said, boys, don't put your guns away if we win. You will need them again. Connolly was not enthralled to other forms of nationalism. He was determined to make a, a, a fight during the period of the, of the First World War when all the socialist international seemed to have backed away from uh, opposition to war. He was pragmatic enough to cooperate, but not ever was he subsumed by other forms of nationalism. I don't think Connolly ever really seems to resolve in his own mind 
what would happen after a successful revolution? If the revolution works, um, what would his, his relationship with these people who have been his comrades in the, the rising, what would it be after the rising? Um, most likely, it would be a very hostile relationship. I mean, it's quite possible uh, one of the first people who would have been shot after a successful Irish revolution would have been James Connolly um, by, by the Irish. You know, he would have been seen as, as an agitator. He would have been seen as someone who's, uh, whose notion of revolution was vastly more profound than that of most of the people he allied himself with. The nationalist rebels really saw Irish independence as an end in itself. Connolly didn't see it as an end in itself. He saw it as completely pointless if it was going to leave in place the same distribution of power and privilege. Connolly saw the point of the revolution uh, as being social, whereas most of his nationalist allies saw the point of the revolution as being purely political in a very narrow sense. I mean, Connolly did not want simply a, you know, a, a form of political independence, which was just about Ireland being, being free from Britain and replicating uh, the same type of unfair state. Remember that he was living at a time where you know, there was huge poverty. Uh, there were tens of thousands of people living in slum conditions uh, in Dublin. Uh, there was huge problems of illiteracy uh, and of hunger. And his belief was that the freedom that Ireland needed to achieve needed to be not just a political freedom, not just a freedom that was based on what colour of flag flew over public buildings, but that it was a freedom that, was, that enabled people to get out of the state of poverty that they were in, and that it was a freedom that would enable working people uh, to achieve their rights. Conscription means the enforced utilising of all the manhood of a country in order to fight its battles. Economic conscription would mean the enforced use of all the economic powers of a country in order to fight its battles. If it is right to take the manhood, it is doubly right to take the necessary property in order to strengthen the manhood in its warfare. An army, according to Napoleon, travels on its stomach, and that being so, all the things that are necessary for the stomach ought to be taken by a national government for the purpose of strengthening its army. James Connolly and the men of uh, 1916 would have certainly known uh, Mrs. McGrath, uh, an anti-recruitment recruiting song. Uh, the First World War, of course, as Connolly knew, was a disaster for the working classes, started by two aristocrats who fell out. Uh, this song was written in 1815 during the Napoleonic Wars, and it still held fast in 1916. <laughs> Oh, Mrs. McGrath, the sergeant said, would you like to make a soldier out of your son, Ted? A scarlet coat and a big cocked hat. Mrs. McGrath, wouldn't you like that with a tour ya For the diddle da, tour a -er -a -er -a -a, with a tour a -a, for the diddle da, tour a -er -a -er -a -a. Now Mrs. McGrath lived on the seashore for the space of seven years or more. A big ship pulled into the bay, then here's my Ted, would you clear the way? With the tour a ya for the diddle da, tour a ya -er a -er -a -a, with the tour a ya for the diddle da, tour a ya -er -a -er -a -a. Now, Captain dear, where have you been? Have you been sailing on the Mediterranean? Have you seen any sight of my son Ted? Tell me, is he living or is he dead? With a tour a ya for the diddle da, tour a ya -er a ya -er a ya, with a tour a ya -er for the diddle da, tour a ya -er a ya -er a ya. Then up comes Ted without any legs And in his place two wooden pegs She kisses him a dozen times or two Saying, holy Moses, tisn't you With a tour a ya for the diddle da Tour a ya a ya a ya With a tour a ya for the diddle da Tour a ya a ya a ya Now were you the wrong or were you blind That you left your two fine legs behind or was it walking on the sea? Were your two fine legs from the knees away? With the tour a ya for the diddle da, tour a ya, 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 with the tour a ya, 
for the diddle da to ray your ray your ray ya. As a socialist, I am prepared to do all one man can do to achieve for our motherland her rightful heritage, independence. But if you ask me to abate one jot or tittle of the claims of social justice in order to conciliate the privileged classes, then I must decline. That is a statement that he carries right through, that he puts himself on the line in 1916 when he walks into that post office. On Easter Monday, of course, Connolly is uh, commander of the Dublin forces. And when he enters the GPO, um, many of the commentators, many of the people who were there uh, spoke about Connolly and spoke about his activity during that, that week. Uh, he had enormous vitality. Um, one of his first duties, of course, was to stand by Patrick Pearce outside the Portugal when they, uh, when Pierce read the Easter proclamation, of course, which Connolly had a huge input to. My parents arrived at the scene as it had been read out. My mother had got tired waiting for my father, who had gone to Rathfarnham to tell McNeil the rising was on, and to ask if he'd change his mind and join it. And she came on into town, went to the GPO, and then my father sat and turned up, went across town to the bottom of uh, Dawson Street, where trams were still arriving. My father got out of a tram, they walked up together and arrived just as a proclamations are being, has been read out. Irish men and Irish women, in the name of God and of the dead generations from which she receives her old tradition of nationhood, Ireland, through us, summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. Having organized and trained her manhood through her secret revolutionary organization, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and through her open military organizations, the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army, having patiently perfected her discipline, having resolutely waited for the right moment to reveal itself, she now seizes that moment. My mother was there also. She stayed there until the Tuesday. She was asked by Pierce to bring a tricolour flag down to the Dublin Castle, which he thought had been captured belatedly on the Tuesday, and it hadn't been, as she said, inadequately wrapped in brown paper. It was never imagined by, by Connolly or his, his revolutionary colleagues in 1916. I don't think they ever imagined that the place would actually be bombarded, that it would be shelled. I think they had the view that a capitalist imperialist power would hardly demolish property in the main street of the capital city. But, uh, of course, they did. On one occasion, he led some of the soldiers up through Princess Street and on uh, attempting to return to the GPO, he was shot and very, very badly injured. And the bones in his uh, ankle were completely um, fragmented. My father stayed until Friday, evacuated the wounded. But as it happened, he had a lot of conversations with Pierce and Plunkett because he was put in charge of the third floor where the food was and he was in charge of the catering side of it. And they'd come up to eat. Of course, he didn't see Connolly because Connolly was wounded and couldn't come upstairs. The British in 1916 found themselves in a situation that they had never actually found themselves in before. They found themselves in a situation of effectively urban guerrilla warfare. And uh, that, that wasn't in the military manuals. And so the, the, the onslaught that, you know, they, they, they brought on, uh, on the GPO uh, and on O'Connell Street was such that inside must have been absolutely unspeakable. <laughs> After the surrender on uh, the Saturday of Easter week, uh, James Connolly was carried by stretcher to Dublin Castle and he was placed there in the officers' quarters in the prison hospital which was in the castle. Uh, Connolly made an enormous impression uh, on the officers who were there and of course on all the nursing staff. He developed a particularly strong relationship with uh, Surgeon Tobin, who was a lay surgeon um, appointed to look after the injured in Dublin Castle. Easter 1916. 
I have met them at close of day, coming with vivid faces from counter or desk among grey 18th century houses. I have passed with a nod of the head or polite meaningless words or have lingered a while and said polite meaningless words and thought before I had done of a mocking tale or a jibe to please a companion around the fire at the club, being certain that they and I but lived where motley is worn, all changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. Tobin also, of course, was placed with a very difficult dilemma because he was asked by the military authorities to uh, decide on whether Connolly was um, in rude enough health to be able to undergo the court-martial. And Tobin did sign a document to say that uh, Connolly was capable uh, 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 of going through the process of the court-martial. That woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill. What voice more sweet than hers when young and beautiful she rode to harriers? This man had kept a school and rode our winged horse. This other, his helper and friend, was coming into his force. He might have won fame in the end. So sensitive his nature seemed, so daring and sweet his thought. This other man I had dreamed, a drunken, vainglorious lout. He had done most bitter wrong to some who were near my heart. Yet I number him in the song. He too has resigned his part in the casual comedy. He too has been changed in his turn. Transformed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. My grandmother remembered on the days after the Rising being chased home from St Pat's Primary School in the Cowgate by local kids who knew that she was a Connolly and that her uncle Jim had been involved in something terrible in Dublin. And my grandmother, to the best of my knowledge, didn't speak about James Connolly for years afterwards until 1966 in the Rising. And the family in general, a large family, knew nothing whatsoever about James Connolly until one day my father picked up a book in a public library that mentioned this man, James Connolly. Hearts with one purpose alone through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone. To trouble the living stream, the horse that comes from the road, the rider, the birds that range from cloud to tumbling cloud. Minute by minute they change. A shadow of cloud on the stream changes minute by minute. A horse hoof slides on the brim and a horse splashes within it. The long-legged moorheads dive and hens to moorcocks call. Minute by minute they live, the stones in the midst of all. Connolly had been court-martialed on the 9th of May 1916 and they were awaiting a decision to that court-martial. On the night of the 11th going into the 12th of May, the first occasion that he had got a natural sleep, uh, he was awakened to say that the decision of the court-martial was that he was to be shot at dawn. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Oh, when may it suffice. That is heaven's part, our part, to murmur name upon name, as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? No. No, not night, but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith, for all that is done and said, we know their dream. Enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in a verse. Macdonough and Macbride, and Connolly and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. He looked at Lily and he said, Well, Lily, I suppose you know what this means. And Lily, distraught, said, But your beautiful life, James, your beautiful life. And Connolly's reply 
Yes, but wasn't it a full life and isn't this a good end? The family went back to Belvedere Place and they sat and waited until dawn and knew that they had lost you know, a father, a loyal father and a very loving father. Connolly and the, the, the people in the Rising came under enormous criticism from the international left uh, for starting a national rebellion in the middle of the war. But Lenin put it right. He said, look, social revolution doesn't happen according to some putting things together from a jigsaw. Okay, there's no standard order of battle. People have to be able to engage and it's a complex social process. Connolly knew that too. Whether it would have been more successful or less successful in one sense is neither here nor there. A fight was coming and Connolly, I think, put his stamp on that part of it. My father was very close to uh, his father, that's my grandfather, and <clears throat> I say particularly the fact that he was with him in the GPO and he was at a, one, of, one of the very most traumatic times of his family history when his uh, father was taken away and he never saw him again, you know, he, he was executed and I think that probably had a very huge effect on my father and I, I, I think that might be part of the reason why he never wants to talk about it very much. Connolly could occasionally use phrases like blood sacrifice as pure stage. After all, he's not a man immune to the incredible militaristic um, talk of the times from 1914 to 16, not only the bloodbath in which the world was, but in which the world's rhetoric was glorying. Yes, commonly would have a certain amount of that. Also, a realization of the old aims of Irish nationalism had its attractions for him. But what he was trying to do clearly was that in any future pantheon, labor and socialism would be represented. That it wouldn't merely be having a token part, but that the socialism would be fundamental to any republic that was being created. So if he takes part in a republic which is going to be snuffed out now, yet they would be remembered surely, and in the event of success, it would be a socialist republic that would be created. If it wasn't going to create itself then and there, then the memory of Connolly and the people of what they had done would charge it. Well, as we know, that didn't happen. His name did remain in a shrine, but it was a shrine which was genuflected at by people who then passed on very rapidly. One thing I always take slight issue with uh, is the notion that Connolly was simply a nationalist. And uh, for those people that, um, that choose to diminish Connolly, that's normally the card that's played. Uh, it's undoubtedly true that obviously the Rising had a nationalist ambition for uh, Irish self-determination. But it was very consistent, it seems to me, uh, with the position of being an internationalist. Uh, there's no evidence that Connolly was nationalist in a pure and simple sense. His whole experience here uh, and in America had been in support of national uh, struggles, national identity, and that an independent Irish nation would play its role with other independent socialist nations in a much more harmonious uh, international uh, climate than was the case in competing international capitalist countries. If he'd simply been one of the great labour organisers and Marxist thinkers of his time and of any time, his work in Scotland, in Ireland, North and South, in the United States, enough on its own to, to, to justify his memory and the teaching of his memory. More respect should have been shown for his teachings. I mean, I came from a house where the bookshelves were full of James Connolly's works and I still have them on my bookshelves uh, because I think they're still very relevant. The capitalist system doesn't work and has been proven not to work and that the only solution uh, to have a, a proper uh, developed society where everyone would be treated equal and with equal opportunities is a socialist society. And I, I say that would be his position quite clearly. James Connolly was an incredible person in terms of being self-taught, teaching himself several languages, but in the times before the internet, before uh, cross-Atlantic flights, James Connolly travelled the world, didn't just join political organisations, but actually started political organisations, was involved in founding the trade union movement here in Edinburgh and the socialist movement here in Edinburgh. And in terms of his work with journalism, 
playwright, poet, propagandist, was way ahead of his time in many, many different respects, and there's absolute credit to himself and to the community that he came from. His physical and moral courage, uh, those are the qualities of a truly great man. I'm proud that he was an Edinburgh man. I think he's the greatest Edinburgh man, and I'm proud to be a native of this city that gave that, in which someone like that was born. So I, I want to claim Connolly as an Edinburgh man, as an Edinburgh patriot and as a Scottish nationalist, I want to claim Connolly as one of ours, as well as one of Ireland's. The contribution he made is, when you look at his history of the contribution he made to the development of the trade union movement, to the debate around the idea of Ireland being an independent state, and just the role that he broadly played in terms of the evolution of radical ideas around socialism coming to terms with national identity. I think those, interestingly, although they're a product of their time in the late 1890s, early 1900s, and just pre the First World War, the fact that we're still grappling with some of those issues in terms of the international economic situation we're in at present, or the nature of nation states. The last meeting with Lily uh, in Dublin Castle on the eve of his execution, he said to Lily, the socialists will question why I'm here, but do they not understand that I am an Irishman? He's not just about potentially the difficult issue in Scotland about the role that he played in the, the Irish uh, demands for independence and the whole issue of the, the Easter Rising. Clearly that's a kind of sensitive issue for some folk, but he's got a much richer and much broader tapestry than just what happened to him over, over that period. A lot of people on the left in, in the last 10 or 15 years have been quite disillusioned quite disorientated by the changes that have taken place, not just in Ireland, but in Scotland and elsewhere in the world, and feel somehow that there's nothing we can do to stop this sort of capitalist globalisation. Connolly would have understood exactly that type of balance of forces against radicals and against the left, because during his time he was fighting against an empire which he said the sun never set on. That empire is now gone. Change can happen. We've seen the whole post-colonial movements happening throughout the world. So I think there's a lot that Connolly would have been dismayed about. He wouldn't have been happy at all, I don't think, of the direction either Scotland or Ireland politically. But he would have always been advocating, I think, that social change is possible. Couldn't imagine Connolly being a great fan of the Celtic Tiger. And in retrospect, I think it doesn't have a big fan club anyway, because now everybody realises that this country got itself into a terrible mess because of irrational exuberance. Uh, and we followed false gods in relation to the markets. Uh, we thought that development and property was going to save the country. Uh, but of course, we were creating um, something totally artificial, which we're all now learning at a very heavy cost. Connolly is the intellectual father of the Irish Labour movement. Um, he, his body of writings, uh, still inspirational today. Uh, I think uh, he, if, if you read Connolly's writings and you know, look at it in the context of the economic times that we are living through and look at the degree to which uh, bankers and developers and so on have enriched themselves and how it all came crashing down and then at the end of the day it's working people that are asked to, to pick up the pieces to pay for it through income levies and taxes and in many cases unfortunately with their jobs in businesses. I think we can see the relevance to, in today's Ireland of uh, what Connolly had to say. The rich get richer the poor get lost They're giving colored sweets To sample at no cost But we can change things We're not afraid Our career is politicians overpaid We still got a sense of humor Poverty's an ugly rumor Some people try to drag us down Dublin city town The ship is sinking But we won't drown Shamed. 
Cause if you haven't got a job, you're not to blame How many young girls just out of school Are forced in taking a slow boat to Liverpool We've a liquid black solution For a dodgy constitution Some people try to drag us down Dublin city town The ship is sinking but we won't drown Here in 